What I've been asked to do is to consolidate about seven years of work into about an hour and a half. And um, as Laura said, I, the intent here was to provide a presentation that you could use. So as you look at the uh, PowerPoint slides uh, in the back of your uh, notebook that you have there, you'll see there's a lot of them there, and they're more than you ordinarily would use, but it's meant to be as comprehensive as possible for us to work at this. So I've been asked to do, answer three basic questions. One is, um, why is there a need to transform organizations and school districts, public education? Second question is, what is the systems thinking thing all about? And the third question is, and to begin to deal with some of the models that we've been working with. I'm not going to deal with all of them, but I've selected four basic models that are the ones that I think you can start with and deal with. Now, before we start this brief journey, one of the things that I like to always talk about is how do you enter the conversation? And um, if you ever read Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, one of the things that Zen Master Suzuki talks about is a quote that I love, and that is, in a beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In an expert's mind, there are few. Beginner's mind, many possibilities, experts, there are few. We're expected to be experts. We are elected to office because we're supposed to be experts. We are executive directors because we're supposed to be experts. Today, I'd like to have you use your beginner's mind and to be open to some of the things that I'm talking about. So let's get started. What we're going to do today is we're going to cover these three areas. One, the state of public education which is basically our industry. We're going to talk about the role in our looking at public education. And then we're also going to talk about transformation from a standpoint of moving one of our current reality is into a new reality, into transforming a systems thinking approach. Let's first look at the state of public education today. Where do our students go to school? Well, if you begin to look at some of the data, we find that there are charter schools in 37 states that cover over 750,000 students. Homeschooling is growing. The access to information, the access to programs for kids to work at home is growing. And obviously, we've got over, 100, over a million kids right now being schooled at home. Then you have the whole issue of virtual high schools. If you were to Google virtual high school, you will see a plethora of schools that come up. These three that I've highlighted, highlighted here, the Excel High School, Cal State High, Addison High, Students can go into these virtual high schools and basically get their degree without ever putting a foot in a public education. Then you also have the whole issue of how do, how do students go to school. In Tennessee two years ago, 40,000 students went to summer school without ever putting their face in a school. Now if you look at all of these, you have 3 million students who are basically not going to school the way we used to know that they went to school. The other issue that we have to deal with is that 30% of our students are dropping out of school. 1.2 million of those students. You also have in the poorest communities, we know this is, this is one of the things that we are struggling with all the time, is that 50% of our African American males are dropping out of school. And finally, you look that 6,000 students are dropping out of school every day. That gives us our 3 million students. Now, that's having an impact upon us. Because if we've got 3 million students that aren't going to school, what happens to the teacher who used to be teaching those students? That has an impact upon our membership base. Now, what about the quality of U.S. education? U.S. ranks 18th among 36 nations that were uh, examined by the Organization for Economic Opportunity and Development. U.S. ranks, along with Estonia, this is an astonishing thing that I found, astonishing thing that we rank with Estonia, in which the percentage of our high school grad graduates are among the lowest and among lower than the workers and their parents. This is the first generation that will have a lower education level than when we went to school. Now we talk about this old bell curve. 
you know, some kids do very well, some kids don't do so well, and a whole bunch of kids do okay. Well, the question is, is that bell curve relevant today? Particularly when we begin to look at what we know about learning and what we can provide for students. Is public education the grand equalizer that it used to be? Can public education fail some students and be irrelevant to other students? And the other one that I have a problem with is and when I talk with some primary uh, teachers, they say, well, you know, I can look at Johnny over here, and I know he's not going to make it. I know Mary over here, she's going to do real well. This one's going to do OK. Can we continue to do that based upon what we know works in schools? We need to begin to look at how we deal with kids in a way that we've never done before. Now, technology is a whole other issue. The issue of unbundling the access to information. It used to be that we could go to school and that's the only place you could get knowledge, get information. Well, let's look at folks that are in third world. Some of you may have been familiar with the one laptop for every child. A hundred dollar computer is being given to over 50 to 100 million kids in third world countries that have never even had a textbook. These laptops are about this big, and they're powered, they have internet capability. They are powered by either solar power or by pulling a string, letting it go back, and you've got 20 minutes of power on the computer. Now, do you think this is going to have an impact upon worldwide upon education? A hundred dollars, these, these, uh, a guy out of MIT has basically uh, been shepherding this. We also know that some students are more proficient than their teachers when it comes to technology. So I often wonder when you go into a classroom and you see a student teaching a teacher, well, which one is the teacher and which one is the student? It's a big issue here. The other issue that we've got is that there's a growing distance between schools and home as it relates to, to education and access of knowledge. I was in Alexandria, Virginia just before I retired and I was talking to this young man. And he says, you know, Mr. Myler, when I go to school, I have to download myself to go to school. I said, what do you mean you have to download yourself to go to school? I can get more information off my computer at home than I can in school. I go to school for a whole other, another reason. It's not to get information. It's basically to be with my peers, be with the socialization piece. So the whole piece of, of technology is impacting education. Now, I want to ask a question here. Is how many people here are over the age of 30? Just raise your hand. I'm clearly over the age of 30. How many are under the age of 30? Look around. No one in this room is under the age of 30. You see, we are all, we are all digital immigrants. We are digital immigrants. Those who are under the age of 30 are digital natives, which means that they have grown up with a computer in their hand. Now, a guy by the name of Don Tapscott wrote a book called Grown Up Digital, and I would submit to you, you should read this book. Because he goes through what the net generation is all about, those who are from age 11 to age 30. They have a whole different world. I watch my grandchildren text all the time. It drives me crazy. They're texting. Then I look at what they've done to their cell phone. They can send video from their cell phone. They get pictures on their cell phone. Question I ask you, what have you done with your cell phone lately? These are the children who we are working with in schools. Well, what are the characteristics of a net generation? There are eight of them that are outlined in his book. The first one is the freedom in everything they do. They get on the computer and basically they can do whatever they damn well please. That has an impact when they come to school. They also love to customize and personalize their stuff. One of the things my granddaughter brought home one time, he said, said BP, well, you know, when you have grandchildren, you get a different name, right? Those of you have grand, I'm BP. So she said, BP, I want to show you my book. Well, what, what do you mean, Mackie? 
Well, she showed me this book that she, every child writes a book, right? Well, she shows me this book, and it is nice and typed. It's got illustrations in it. it I said, Mac, who did this? Did your, did your mom help you do this? She said, no. Teacher help you? No. I did it myself. Well, I remember the first book that my daughter brought home. It was handwritten, taped on the side, little hand illustration, very nice. My son, who was nine years later, brought home his book. His book was typed. We still have these things. I don't know why, but we still have them. It was typed. He had taped in some illustrations. McKinsey's was all printed. It was like you could go to the bookstore and buy this thing all by herself. These are the children that we have to provide for. She loved to customize. They scrutinize. They look very carefully at what's going on. They also look and, and expect integrity and openness in the process. By the way, think of this for those of you about the net gen people you have on your staff at the association and how you're relating to these to those folks. They expect if you say that we're going to have collaborative conversation, they expect to have collaborative conversation. If you don't have collaborative conversations, they get very upset about that because they have a high standard as it relates to their looking for integrity. 